Mike, it is lovely to have you here at StatSig's Significant Summit. For everyone who is just tuning in from home, what is your full name and what do you do? Uh, my name is Mike Bernal. Uh, I primarily coach Little League right now, um, which is a very humbling experience. Uh, but in addition to that, I've been an investor uh, for the past eight or nine years. And so uh, I'm one of the board members at StatSig and I've worked with them from the very beginning. Um, and I'm an investor in a bunch of other companies as well. And you worked with VJ at yeah, so I was Meta, at, then Facebook for a long time. Exactly. I was at Facebook for eight or nine years, and I worked with VJ for most of that time. So, so pretty, pretty exciting years. We're in the middle of our Meta episode research. I know. It's great. It's great. I, I'm very excited about uh, I, was, I was able to go to the, uh, the event you guys had at the Chase Center, and it was, it was epic. So, Thanks for coming. It was very yeah. fun. Thanks for coming. Mark has, some very, uh, Mark has some very loud shirts now. He does. Did you see the one he was wearing today? He has another. I haven't gotten a chance to understand the meaning behind it, but yet another large, I think, Latin letter or Greek letter. Mike Amiri special. Yeah. Can I, can I digress for one second? Please. Please. One of my favorite, uh, one of the most hilarious arguments I recall, uh, there was a Zuck review uh, like a decade ago, and there was this guy I worked with named Doug, and uh, uh, someone, someone referenced a um, uh, sort of a, a Latin statement and uh, uh, there was some, I think it was Cato maybe, or Plan there, there's some uh, pair of like the elder and the younger. Oh yeah, Plan and, uh, the older, I don't think yeah. it's Pliny. I, yeah, I, I yeah that's, the I yeah it's that's the beer, I think it's Cato. Yeah, that's the beer, I think it's Cato, but, um, uh, and this one person in the room started uh, like arguing it was the elder, and Mark was like, it was the younger. And this person argued with him for 10 minutes, and I was like, I feel like this is the one topic that probably Mark is going to be right on, and, and of course Mark was right on it. So, um, do not argue with Mark about Roman orators. So. <laughs> there was a um, was uh, Carthage must be destroyed was yeah, a saying for a uh, while Carthage within Facebook. Uh, Delende est, I think. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> the, the posters were in Latin. So, and did that specifically reference Google Plus? Was that what the hubbub was all about? Uh, Yes, effectively. Um, I think it was, um, uh, yes, it was, it was a little bit of an inside joke, so. It feels lost to history that, that, that there was a point at Facebook where that was considered like the existential threat, even though now it's the butt of every joke. Yeah, it's useful, I think. You know, th there's a whole never waste a good crisis, and I think whenever there's something like that, it is a focusing moment for everyone to sort of get stuff done, and I think that was that moment. And the joke about uh, Carthago de Landes, which I'm probably mispronouncing, is uh, I guess at the time, and this was during the Punic Wars, uh, the orators would be talking about anything. They might be talking about healthcare, they might talk about the sewage system, they would be giving these great speeches, and then the end to every speech as a non sequitur was, and Carthage must be destroyed. And so that was kind of the rallying cry for six months. So. Love it. Okay. Never, never, uh, never underestimate the power of a mantra. Exactly. We're having we're having Vietnamese food today for lunch and Carthage recipe <laughs> destroyed. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> so great. So great. Well, a question that we've been asking everyone that we sit down with today is, as you think through uh, company history, what are the companies to you that have been the single greatest at product development, whatever that means to you? You know, there are a couple of forms of this, and, and the, there's a bunch of probably obvious examples. I'll try to think of non-obvious ones. I obviously have a soft spot and a bias towards meta, and I think the defining characteristic of that, of the meta approach to product development is just sort of informed velocity. Uh, it's just moving as fast as you can, but doing it in a intentional direction and one where you are constantly compensating to sort of uh, get to the right end goal, uh, which is obviously a lot of the founding story of StatSig. Um, I mean, I think the obvious converse of that is Apple, which is just very much uh, kind of calling your shot, not, uh, not to caricature them or, or anything, but it's kind of not caring about data, not caring about what people think, just having a, like a view about what something should be and then building it. Um, and I think those are kind of the polar opposites. Um, I'm sure there are a bunch of people in between. Um, I think one of the things that is hardest, especially in the consumer space, is there's an element of both luck and being good. And like once something has a lot of momentum, like how well you perpetuate that momentum 
is a second order thing, like the momentum is the first order thing. And so kind of the most interesting companies are the ones that I think are able to do many different products and have those be successful, which I think is true for both Meta and Apple. So. It's pretty rare to have second, third, fourth products that are as successful as your initial one. Google is always the sort of poster child for they've done one thing really, really well for 25 years. Um, they've done two things in-house. They, they did Gmail as well. Actually, everything else at Google is an acquisition. Um, but uh, which is not, you I mean, mean I actually, think, maps. I mean, they uh, did a lot of work after the acquisition, but yeah, but uh, the seed of everything maps was an acquisition. Google Earth was an acquisition, not to diminish uh, what Google is doing. But I do think there is I actually think a healthy m a environment is good for consumers because you take the seed of an idea and you scale it up massively. Um, but it is very hard to do de novo innovation, I think, in a company that is already successful on sort of one dimension. So but Google has two, Google and Gmail. So. It's interesting on this study. I mean, in some sense, you can make the same argument about Facebook meta of, you know, what else have they built besides the acquisitions. On the other hand, Facebook itself has become a completely different product probably four or five times throughout its history, uh, just within the same product. Uh, I think this might predate your time at Facebook, but the launch of Newsfeed, that is a homegrown thing from Facebook that was not obvious at the time. Social media at, at, up until that moment in history meant profile pages. And a home, you know, the, if you went to the root directory instead of profile.php, question mark, whatever, uh, you, you just looked at the root directory. It's a pretty uninteresting page. And the notion of we are going to make the home page of a social media site this like evergreen. The personalized newspaper, as Mark used to talk interesting, about. Interesting. Like that is a. Um, completely new innovation, not from M&A, that happened several years into the company's existence. That feels a little bit overlooked in the way that people judge Meta as, oh, they've just acquired their way to dominance. I, I think that, I mean, I think that's true. I think it launched on September 7th, 2006, and I think the, so it was before my time, but I mean, I, I think one of the, like one of the beautiful things about these kinds of consumer products, especially high engagement consumer products, is there are, there are just so many emergent behaviors, and if you just like pay attention to the emergent behaviors and then lean into them, it kind of just, um, if you are humble enough to follow your users instead of sort of being prescriptive, like you will figure out what to build. And I think in that case, like looking at uh, the degree to which people on the site would sort of visit profiles to see if anything changed was kind of, there was, there was a, huge novelty and an incredibly important change, but there's also a sort of obviousness in retrospect of like, well, obviously this is how it should work. Mm -hmm. I think there's a bunch of things that are parts of Facebook that were sort of following the emergent behavior of the system, so. In a world where a lot of this was, uh, experimentation was pioneered at Facebook, who do you think is doing it well in the next generation? Companies that have sort of picked up the mantle of uh, this as a core competency? It's a good question. The Besides Meta, who continues yeah. to do it very meta, well. Meta, yeah, I mean, there is, a, uh, there is a large meta diaspora. I mean, there's a lot of meta people at OpenAI right now, and I think OpenAI is a, a large StatSig customer that I think is um, being sort of very iterative and innovative. Uh, I mean, it's kind of clearly the right way to do product development, and so I think like most of the successful consumer product development um, folks will basically follow this path. Um, you talk at the end of your podcast about like the seven powers, and uh, I don't think I fully understand counterpositioning, but I suspect that there will be one company that counterpositions by saying we're not going to look at any data and we're just going to do what we want. But I think everyone else will probably follow this path at least for like the next epoch. So, hmm. as you reflect back on your own career, are there certain inflection points where you look at and, and point to it and say? I completely changed my mind on something because of the way data showed up to me, either from customers or from the organization, and I now believe something entirely different going forward. Yeah. Um, so there's probably a couple. Uh, one, and this is going to sound a little bit funny, but I think, you know, I was a PM. I, I started my career as a PM at Microsoft, and the PM job is funny because it is the job that is most different between a tiny company and a large company. Like, kind of what an engineer does at a startup is pretty similar to what an engineer does at Facebook. PM is completely different. PM at a small company, 
is much closer to actually, I think, the idealized version, what people think of as a PM in terms of probably owning a product and talking to customers and figuring out what you should build. I think in a large company, like the primary job of a PM is actually just, it's kind of the communication substrate of the organization. Um, and that's not bad or good, it's actually a necessary function, it's just wildly different than, than being at a startup. You know, I was a PM at Microsoft when it was quite large, and I think one of the things I was good at, it was bringing a bunch of people together, uh, getting everyone on the same page, trying to like build consensus towards a thing, et cetera, et cetera. And I think for a lot of my career, I kind of, um, I was able to navigate a bunch of loud voices and try to figure out sort of uh, as optimal a solution as I could within a whole bunch of constraints. And there were, you know, there were at times, Facebook was actually like a very congenial place, but there were at times people that were kind of like the bull in the china shop of like, yeah, but like this is just what we should do. And I'm like not gonna, like, uh, I, I'm not going to buy into this sort of like consensus culture. Um, and I think one of the things, and, and this was very much a lesson from investing, is you can, um, uh, in investing, the, the core thing you do is make a decision. Like in operating, you make a thousand decisions and none of the decisions matter. What really matters is like the speed with which you make decisions and the speed with which you fix decisions. But, as in, but in investing, there is like a singular decision. decision. There's probably like yeah. two decisions a year that matter. There's a lot of ceremony around it. It's like electing a pope. You like write a bunch of things <laughs> down. You vote, you vote again. You You're vote not again. sure how it happens. Eventually the smoke is white. Um, and because the decision making is like the core of the job in many ways, um, there's a lot of data you can look at. And I think one of the things that I found is like consensus is like consensus is a path to the mean. Um, and like what actually matters is like figuring out what you think and sort of act like really decide the importance of like personal conviction over consensus. Uh, it sounds kind of obvious, but it is actually. I think empirically true and a thing that I have like come and, and I'm still internalizing, but I have come to internalize. So. Yeah, I wanted to ask about that too. I mean, in the time since you left Facebook Meta and became an investor, I feel like so much of what Facebook pioneered on the data side has now come into the investing world. Like how <laughs> you were joking about the white smoke and the Pope and like, you know, we came from the investing world and like literally that's what it used to feel like of, well, you'd all sit around the table after a pitch from a series A company and like it could go any number of directions depending on what side of the bed people got up on that day. Yep. Now there's so much more data. Has it changed has the process? Has it changed the process? <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I don't think it changes in the moment, like it, there's not a, especially for I think early stage companies, it's not like there is a scorecard you can go to and say, well, but like the scorecard here is pretty good. Um, I think where it is most useful is in uh, identifying and helping to quantify biases in terms of, well, this is like a common mistake that we make, or this is like a common pattern that is like a good pattern. The problem with all of these is uh, the N is very small, so getting to significance is hard, but you definitely start to feel, even at small n, you start to find counterintuitive patterns that at least if you're conscious of, you can try to compensate for. So. Well, thanks, Mike. We really yeah. appreciate thanks, the time. Mike. Yeah, thank you so much.